Alright guys, this video we're going to cover the clavicle. Not too bad, most people think of it as their collarbone. Okay, So you have the acromial end here, which looks like that, and then you have this flatter end right here, which is the sternal end. And clavicle, that's what most people need to know about the clavicle. Alright guys, in this video we're going to cover the scapula. Okay, so on the scapula we have three different borders. We have the superior border on top. We have the lateral border over here with all of the interesting artifacts. And we have the medial, really long medial border right here. So on the superior border you have the suprascapular notch right there. It's that little notch you can see right there. And then we have the inferior angle down here which is just the point. And we have the superior angle up here which is just this point. Um, on the interesting artifact side we have the glenoid fossa or cavity right there where the humerus inserts or articulates with the scapula. On the front side you also have this finger-like process known as the coracoid process. If we flip it to the back we have two interesting facts. We have the scapular spine right here which most people think of as their shoulder blades. So scapular spine which is leading to this flat process known as the acromion process. Okay. Then we have some fossas, which just simply means shallow depression in a bone. So you have your subscapular fossa in the front, just below the superior border. And then on the back, once you locate the scapular spine, above it is the supraspinous fossa, and below it is the infraspinous fossa. All right, guys, in this video, we're going to cover the humerus or upper arm bone. Okay, so we're going to start up here at the proximal end. So on the proximal end, you have the head of the humerus right here. This is a very smooth process right there, and it's medial. On the lateral side, directly opposite, you have this large bump known as the greater tubercle. And then more on the anterior or the front side, you have this lesser tubercle. And in between the two tubercles, you have this little groove, and that is known as the inner tubercular sulcus. Okay? So also what else do we need to know on the proximal end? We need to know the necks. So we have the anatomical neck, which kind of makes a circle just around the head of the humerus, separating out the head of the humerus from the rest of the bone. Then right here where I'm putting my hands, separating out the um, head of the humerus and greater and lesser tubercles from the rest of the bone, this is the surgical neck. I think surgeons like to cut, so it cuts more of the bone off. So then down at the distal end of the humerus, we start to look and we're like, oh my goodness, there's a glare. So you have this very round marble-like process and that is known as the capitulum. Okay, And then these two bumps right here, these two bumps right here are known as the trochlea of the humerus. Okay, Then we have some depressions that I'm going to talk about. So right above the trochlea is the coronoid fossa. And right above the capitulum is the radial fossa, which is very hard to see. On the back side or posterior side of the distal end, you can see the olecranon fossa, where the olecranon of the ulna fits in. Now, we're going to use what we know to find what we don't know. So, we find the proximal end. The head of the humerus is always medial, so we're just going to trace down the side of the humerus until we get to this side. This little bump right here, right above the trochlea, is the medial epicondyle. Then you go to this side and you're like, this is the greater tubercle. On the lateral side, you trace it down, okay? Right above the capitulum is the lateral epicondyle. All right, guys, in this video, we're going to talk about the radius, which is one of your forearm bones, okay? So the radius, it is important to note the radius in anatomical position is thumb side. Going to be, oh, can't see my thumb, is the thumb side. Okay? That will help you, like in clinical situations where you need to locate the radial pulse, it's on the thumb side. So, the radius bone, what do we need to know? We have the proximal end up here, and we have the distal end down here. On the proximal end, you need to know this top portion of it is the head of the radius, kind of looks like a stamp or a seal of approval. Below the head is the neck. Okay, so we have the neck of the radius right here, and then this little piece that juts out right here is the radial tuberosity, radial tuberosity. Then at the distal end, you do need to know two structures and specifics. You need to know 
this little pointy piece right here is the styloid process of the radius. Important to note since you have two other styloid processes that I know of in your body. So styloid process of the radius. Then we have this little notch right here that allows the ulna to articulate it with it. So it's the ulnar notch of the radius and that is it. In this video, guys, we're going to cover the ulna, which is in your forearm. So it's your other forearm bone. The radius was the other one that is thumb side. So which side do you think this one is? This is going to be pinky side. So pinky side is the ulna. And we have the proximal end right here, which looks like a little wrench or something. And we have the distal end down here, which is much smaller. So on the proximal end, you need to know this top process is known as the olecranon process, which fits into that olecranon fossa of the humerus. Coronoid process on the bottom, it's very pointy, fits into that coronoid fossa on the humerus. Then we have this big divot connecting the olecranon process to the coronoid process. This is known as the trochlear notch because it rotates over the top of the trochlea on the humerus. Then we have this little depression in the bone right here. This is known as the radial notch, and it allows the radius to articulate with the ulna at the proximal end. So on the distal end, all you need to know is that this little, di uh, this little process coming out right here is the styloid process of the ulna. And that's it. All right, guys, in this video, we're going to cover the carpal bones or the wrist bones and also the hand and finger bones. So we have a couple of mnemonics to help you remember the eight carpal bones. We have um, so long to pinky, here comes the thumb, or we have some lovers try positions that they can't handle. Okay, so let's look at this. So we have right here starting thumb side, okay? Starting proximal thumb side, you have scaphoid. Then we move over one to lunate. Then over by the pinky, still proximal, we have triquitrium. Trying to hide on top of it, which is this little pebble, this is the pisiform. Then we move to the distal four carpal bones. We have this little guy has a hook, and this is the hamate bone with the hamulus, which is the name for the hook. Then we have the largest of the eight. We have the capitate, which lines up with the middle finger. Then we have the trapezoid, which is the smallest of the eight, lines up with the pointer finger. And then distal on thumb side, that is going to be trape trapezium. Trapezium. Okay, so this is the mnemonic that loops. This is. Scaphoid, lunate, triquitrium, pisiform, hamate, capitate, trapezoid, trapezium, or we go. Scaphoid, lunate, triquitrium, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate hamate. Okay. Next, what attaches these carpal bones to the hands? Okay. So your hand bones is what you think of right here. Okay. So these are your metacarpals. Okay. Metacarpals. So they are numbered one through five. Thumb side is one. So this is metacarpal one, metacarpal two, metacarpal three, metacarpal four, and metacarpal five ending on the pinky. So then each of the metacarpals has some phalanges coming off of them. So these four fingers right here all have three phalanges coming off of them. A proximal, middle, and distal phalanx, which is singular. The thumb only has two. It only has a proximal and a distal phalanx. So let's do an example of one so that you know how to name them. So let's just randomly pick this one. So this is on the pinky, and this is the proximal phalanx of metacarpal five. Okay? The reason you have to put proximal phalanx of metacarpal 5 is because there are phalanges in your toes as well. And for those, you would say of metatarsal. This is of metacarpal to make sure you know you're in the hand. 